uh, I wanted to do a PowerPoint presentation, but with all that happened with Ron, I didn't get to put it together because I really wanted to show you some pictures to go with this, but you just have to use your imagination. Now, there's a place in Namibia called the Namib Desert. It's one of the most inhospitable places on earth, and it is so inhospitable that it's often referred to as the place God forgot. I wonder how many of us here tonight are feeling like God has forgotten us, that things are just not happening. There seems to be no life happening in, the, in our situation that we were tempted to believe that God has forgotten us. What one would think that in such a dry place, in such an inhospitable place, that you cannot prosper. But I'm here to tell you tonight, you can prosper in your dry place. You can prosper in your dry season. The Namib Desert is actually teeming with life, and it's not just small animals and insects and but large predators like lions, there's giraffes, there's monkeys, there's meerkats, there's elephants, the biggest of the big, right? But there's one ingredient that all mammals need to survive, and that is water. So how can this desert that's so harsh and uninviting support such a diversity of life? How can you, in your dry situation, support life? How can it, life be supported in the situations you are in? By definition, dry means totally devoid of moisture. It's parched, it's withered, it's wilted. And season means a time which is characterized by a particular circumstance or feature. So it's very important to know what season you are in. Okay? You have to know. Because when you know what season you're in, you know how to, I don't want to use the word react, but be proactive in the situation that you're in. Jesus told the woman at the well that he has the living water, in John 4 verse 10 to 15, which if she drank from it, she would never thirst again. In the first chapter of John, we're also told that Jesus is the word made flesh. Therefore, it stands to reason that if we are going through a dry season, we might have, and I say might have because there are situations where you, it may not, <laughs> I'm going to show you, it's not necessarily that you have pulled away from the word, but you may have pulled away from the source of the living water, which is the word. So what are the things that cause this? One, big one, disobedience. Disobedience causes the land to become desolate, dry, dead. Disobedience causes you to pull away from God, who is the source of life. So when you pull away from the source of life, you're, you're virtually killing your spirit, you're killing yourself. And the further away you move, is the more the situations become dead. Another thing that causes the, the dry season is distractions with worry. It shifts our focus from God to the problem. And these things loom so large before us that all we see is the mountain, the giant, and we allow fear to take over our lives. And giving into fear negates faith because fear comes from doubting God. Another thing that causes this is delays. God's promises are not coming through when you think it should, but God operates in eternity. He knows our beginning and our end. He knows that if he gives you your desire for this particular thing now, then you are not mature enough to handle it and you have to be put through a maturing process in order to be able to handle what you're asking for, okay? So he will not give us anything that harm us and he will not give us anything that we are not ready to handle with maturity. So for those of you asking for the big money, can God trust you with the tithe? Can he trust you with the $10,000 that you're getting per week? And when taxes come out of it, you have eight or $9,000 left for you go. Oh, we can't tithe out of this little bit of money. 
And if you can't trust you with that, how you expect him to trust you with something bigger? Because I, I'm here to tell you, you know, if you don't get into the practice of doing the small things, when the, doing what you should with the small things, when the big thing come, you are not going to do it. Okay, you can always say, oh, if I had $100,000, I could tithe. But really, um, it's a test of our faithfulness about what we do in the good times, or is it what we do even when the times are bad? Do we do the things we are supposed to do even when the times are bad? Sometimes, first is created by reading the word itself. And one of the most curious features of the Namib Desert is that it's a desert created by water. That makes sense? <laughs> but it is. It's actually created by the rough seas and high, the, the, the coastline of the Namib Desert is so rough that it's become known as a graveyard for ships. For ships. Ships. That one. <laughs> And the rough seas and the high wind blow the sun inland. At the same time in the mountains, when it rains, the water carves out rocks and makes its way to the sea. However, because of the porous sandy soil and the heat, the water never makes its way out to the sea. Heat in our sense represents intense trouble. And what you find is that it doesn't make its way out to the sea, but it sinks below the surface. Heat, intense trouble should make you go more into the word that the word sink into your spirit to be there as a reservoir for you in time of need. And you're going to see how this sinking of the water into the sand, how it benefits the animals in the desert and can actually support life. So as you read the word, you develop a thirst for more. And you want to dig deeper to scope out the treasures. One of the things we need to recognize, believe it or not, the dry times that you go through, the dry season, is actually a season of thanksgiving. Because, I mean, I know it sounds strange. You're going through all this trouble. Come, you should give thanks. But look at it. When things are going great, do you remember the small things or what you perceive as the small things that God is doing for you? No? But I guarantee you, when you're going through a dry time, you see, when you, you used to buy, um, let's say, Minute Maid as your drinks, but now you can only afford one box juice or one bag juice. Trust me, when you can buy the bag juice, you're going to thank God for the money where you find to buy the bag juice. It's a time to give thanks because let me tell you something. God does provide for you in the dry season. You're not going to die of thirst, but you just have to know when the opportunity to drink comes along. Okay? Isaiah 44 verse 3 and 4 says, I will pour out water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon thy seed and blessing upon thy offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. Psalm 63 verse 1. When David was in the wilderness of Judah, he says, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. And my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. How dry is your ground? And how thirsty are you? In the Namib Desert, when the mist comes in from the sea, animals who know go straight to the trees. And if you look, one of the pictures I wanted to show you was the trees actually having drops of water. But you have to go there at a certain time of the morning to get it. Because if you miss that window of opportunity, and it's, it's so much water on the leaves, it's like drinking. You, 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 will, you miss that opportunity to get the moisture of the leaves, of what you're feeding on, then you have to wait again until the next time comes around. It's important that you do not miss your windows of opportunity to quench your thirst. A lot of us miss it when we don't come to church. Yeah. 
not coming to church to hear the word and to drink of the word. It, it, it caused you to miss your window of opportunity to, for a word to speak into a dry situation in your life. Listen to me. You notice that when, even when we sick, me, we crawl, come at church. When we miss church, you must know that we can't avoid it. Right? And every time I miss, me hear say something did go on. And me say, God. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> but I remember the first time Apostle Bishop came here. Um, a lot of you might remember, so just before I went in the hospital. And I was so... I, Pastor, I'd actually come and pick up my grandchildren. And Christy said she would stay with me because she wasn't leaving me alone. I was in so much pain. And after about 20 minutes, I just lying down, you know. I just kept having this feeling that I was missing something. And I said, you know what? I said, Chrissy, I go to church, you know. I don't care if I have to crawl go there. I don't care if when I reach, I have to crawl up my belly. But I go. And if I have to walk or crawl up at the altar, I that me do for if I do the healing there, that's how I get it. And I was going through a period where I really needed to hear a word that encouraged me. I wasn't hearing God for myself. I hear for everybody else, you know. But me not hear for myself. And I had made up my mind. I said, God, me not hear you, you know. But me know say so you are hear me. I mean, I stop talk till you answer. So I'll be crying out to you until I hear something. When I came and I sat right there, Apostle Bishop was ministering to some people where they sat. And he called me and told me to come up. And right away, me hear a little voice. I said, make him couldn't minister to you with me. I said, listen, shut up, man. Because if I belly me, I have to go up and me, I go up there. And he spoke a word that I really, I was thirsty for. Let me tell you something. Never miss your windows of opportunity to quench your thirst. Never. Because you're going to have to wait till the window open again. It could be next week. It could be tomorrow. It could be next year. But your word at that time that you miss is your word for now. It's your word for now. You can't afford to miss it. That is what is going to soak that dry place in your spirit. That is what the thing that you need to hear. If you check it, when you miss church and you ask and find out what one is something that you needed to hear. But let me tell you something. It's different, you know, than when so I come and I say, Leon, what them they do at church? And Leon said, why them cover this topic, you know? But when you come and hear it for yourself, and it's sinking to your spirit. It's a totally different thing. Another purpose that dry season serves is to give rest to the land. That might sound weird, but it's not. Animals in the African region sense when the dry season is coming and they begin their migration towards where they know water will be. During the wet season, they drink as much as they, are, they can and are able to travel for miles on what they have inside of them. Listen to me, man. It's so when you're full of the word, even at dry season, you have things inside of you. You have water inside of you you can't drink from because what? You create a well inside of yourself where you can dip up for that any time. But when you don't have the word inside of you, trust me, when you dip up and muddy you come up with, you understand me? You have to have, listen, man. You have to have the word deep inside of you. That in any situation, man, you can't, you can't say, God, deep up and say, all right, God, may I drink from the one you call your word say. But if you don't know, what you going to use? If you don't know, what are you going to use? You will get sun and you get mud and think of water. The majority of the grazers, Oh, sorry, they know where all the water holes are and, and how to find them. But the majority of the grazers leave the land, and so the land has a chance to get rest. So when rain time comes again, the land just springs up easily. Things just springs up easily. And sometimes the Lord will bring about desolation so that the land can have rest. 
because we are commanded, you know, that we must give the land rest every, every seven years, okay? But some of us who farm, we're going to ride through. But you see that seven year, seventh year when the land is supposed to rest is a demonstration of how much you trust God to provide for you even when you're not plant nothing, right? But because you will not give the land rest, him have to make it desolate so that it can have rest. And so Leviticus 26, verse 22 and 30, 33 to 35 speaks of God's promise to cause the land of Israel to become desolate so that it shall have rest as a punishment for iniquity. So I encourage you in your times of dryness to find rest in the Lord. He's your hiding place and your refuge in times of trouble. And under the shadow of his wings, you can find rest from the harshness of life that you experience. Hosea 14 verse 4 says, I will heal their apost apostasy. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. How does, you, how does God's anger turn from you? When you repent. Okay? So if you know that the dryness you're going through, it's because of some iniquity or sin in your life. Just repent. Right? Because the longer you sit down there with it, is the more you're going to sit down in the dryness. So, you know, one of the things that I, I, is a pet peeve of mine. You know me. I, I am all about how you use words in your life. How you speak into your life. You see, when you, you, you in these hard times, we have a way to say, Oh, me just a, me a survive. Does God really want you to just survive? Or does he want you to thrive? Right. Survive means that you continue to live or exist in spite of danger or hardship. But thrive means that you prosper, you flourish, you grow, you develop well and vigorously. Which one you want to do? Thrive. All right. Deuteronomy 30 verse 9 says, The Lord will make you prosper abundantly in all the work of your hands with children, etc. Acts 3 verse 17 says, The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. Now, um, we all know that Egypt was a dry season for the Israelites. Okay? And yet God made them prosper in their dry season but when them left them left with enough so they could have buy food along the way and buy water and all of that and if they never have money to do that then you know proverbs 16 verse 20 says those who give heed to instruction that's obedience prosper and blessed are those who trust in the lord proverbs 17 verse 20 one whose heart is corrupt does not prosper one whose tongue is perverse falls into trouble. And what I'm pointing out here is that the Bible is replete with evidence that God wants us to thrive, not just survive. So how do you thrive in your dry season? I'm going to give you about five or six points. First one is obedience. In all your seasons, be obedient to God. But if your dry season, as I said before, is because of sin or iniquity, repent before God and just walk in obedience. Do not give in to the temptation to drink from a different cistern. Jeremiah 2 verse 13 speaks about the people forsaking God, the spring of living water, and digging cisterns which can't hold water. In other words, don't give in to other doctrines and forsake the word of God because it's easier for you to handle okay not all parts of the bible are going to make you comfortable but if something don't make you comfortable ask god why is this making me uncomfortable and god show me what it is so we can deal with it okay but don't because um there's another doctrine that say as pastor would say grace because of grace you can do this you're gonna follow that because it's easier for you to follow that than to follow the the true word of God, then, you know, what you're doing is you're drinking from a cistern with can't hold no water. 
Second point is you must know where to find water. In Genesis 26, we see Isaac digging wells in his desert times. Please note, God caused him to flourish in this desert because of his obedience to the command not to go to Egypt. And he did not stop digging wells. The word well in this context, I looked it up, <clears throat> is from the Hebrew root word ba'ar, ba'ar, which means to declare, to explain, to make plain. So in your desert season, you must speak the word of God into your lives. Dig wells and find the living water. Did you know <clears throat> that your body experiences thirst long before you are aware of it? Mm -hmm. By the time you begin to feel the dryness in your throat, like I'm feeling now, <clears throat> you're actually experiencing the start of dehydration. And this comes about because we're not managing our water intake. A regular intake of the word enables us to thrive in the dry season because we do not become dehydrated. So if you're becoming dehydrated, you are, you are not drinking enough water you're not reading the word enough and if you're reading it you're not digging you're not trying to see some of us are surface readers we just read one thing and we don't we don't we might memorize the verse you know but we don't ask god what this really mean in my situation right now we don't make a note of it and, and see how it applies to what is happening to you and that's the only way you're really going to get revelation. You have to be asking God, okay, God, how does this apply to me now? Okay? So, <clears throat> when you know where to find water, that ensures that you don't get thirsty in the dry land. Third option, be a tree. I mentioned earlier in my example about the Nabib Desert, that water seeps off into the sandy porous soil however it doesn't just dissipate because there are trees in that desert that supports life in this very harsh environment green trees i don't mean it just is some dry up tree i mean green leaves leafy trees so how do they thrive in the desert anybody want to guess huh? deep roots they have stuck the roots deep the roots the roots <laughs> deep into the water table and to stay grounded so you don't topple over in this dry time because you see when you're not when the roots not getting enough water you know what happens is that the tree becomes brittle and the slightest wind just blow it away so you have to sink your roots deep into the word. Do not be content with just what is on the surface. The trees also in this desert provide shade and food for the animals that inhabit it. Can you be a tree like this for someone in need of water? Because a lot of times we're going through our dry times. We never think about anybody else. We're so focused on how thirsty we are, where to find water. And if you find water, you know, tell nobody because you don't want nobody else at the water hole. Can you really be a tree that will shade someone in their dry time? Have to ask yourself that. Can you provide a shelter or feed someone who comes to you for help? in your dry season and if someone comes to you in your dry season are you willing to help that's very important you have to be willing to let this person shade under your tree you have to be willing to let this person eat up the leaves you have to be willing to help or you're not demonstrating love are you willing to give your last like the widow gave Elijah her last. God might just send one of his angels in the form of such a one to test you. Do you think you could pass the test? Ask yourself that. The next way to thrive in the dry season is to press into the secret place. 
Sometimes in our dry season, we become impatient with others and with God. We curse, we lose our tempers. The elephant is symbolic of patience and temperance. It knows where to find and how to sniff out water. In this particular desert, when it smells, what it does, it goes where all the trees are and it just sniffs around, the bull elephant sniffs around for where the water table is. And then what he does now is that he uses his foot and he digs and he digs and he digs until water springs up. But what it does with that first water that comes up is that he siphons off all the sand and the mud out of the water, leaving a clear pool, a fresh pool. So we need to know where to find water in our desert times. Sometimes somebody will come along to give you a word. You're gonna soak it up? No. The word might be murky, muddy, because they might have heard a word from God for you in truth, you know. But because they know of your situation, they might have put in what they think also. So you must test this against the word of God. You mustn't just, in your desperation, soak up any word without testing it, okay? You have to test it, sift off the mud, sift off the sand so you can get the clear and undiluted, unpolluted word. So, you must know how to do this and measure it against what's said. And are you willing to dig, to press in, so you can have fresh water? Some people just, sometimes, you know, you know that thirst can make you crazy, that you drink anything, okay? It has been known that men who have been stranded at sea will drink their own urine just to get some liquid in them will drink the salt water, which just kills them, right? But if you sift off the word, if you sift off the water where you get, put it through a strainer, measure it against the container, the Bible, and say, all right, this look like it. And you can drink. Don't let desperation get the better of you. The next thing you must do is share your word with others. Share the word, meaning the word that God gives, not necessarily a personal word. So the anima, other animals in the desert know when the elephants are going to dig for water. And because they say they are too small to dig so deeply, they wait for the elephant to dig so that they can drink. Now, are you willing to share some of the water you get? Others around us need encouragement. They don't have the strength in their desperation to dig as deep as you are able to. When you get a word that can encourage them and lift them out of this where they are, that can quench the thirst, that can soak that dry place in them, then do it. When you are generous in your time of plenty, that's fine. But can you be generous and encourage somebody in your time of need? Can you remain faithful to spread the gospel? We need to share our water with those who are thirsty also. You must know the secret place and you must pass on the secret. The elephants pass on the secret of the water sources from generation to generation. We need to teach our children how to pray their way through the rough times of their lives. We have to teach them to recognize trees that have deep roots and encourage them to dig there. And if we are not trees with deep roots, how can we teach our children to recognize when somebody is rooted in the word of, word of God? We can't because they don't know what that looks like. That's not what they're seeing in their home, right? And, and you know, one thing I know my grandchildren know that me face a situation, the mother are going to hear me, halafi, hallelujah, or they are going to hear me praise and worship, but they know that about me. You understand me? Them, they, if I face a situation and I'm not praying, one of them will check my temperature. Okay? So, the responsibility, if we don't demonstrate right living and dependency on God, we cannot teach our children because we will not be demonstrating 
what we are saying. And we have to demonstrate it. Because let me tell you, children are smart, you know. They will say, how are you telling me this? And you doing that. You know, it's like the ad with, with the JPS. Daddy, I thought you said we're not to thief. <laughs> right? So the elephants in the Namib desert knows where all the secret places are today. And if you know the secret place of the Most High God, I assure you, you are assured of water all year round. That's the oasis in this particular desert. There's a little, there's a little place where a trickle of water flows all year round. All year, dry time or no. And the animals that know where to go, they go there and they drink and drink deeply. Predators are there too, you know. But they go anyway because they know that is a true water source. So, Isaiah 14 verse 5 says, I will be like dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. You let God be that dew to you, be that moisture in your life. And you'll be able, like the seed of Lebanon, to send down your roots deep into his word. And finally, be encouraged. Be encouraged. A season by definition is a time that's characterized by a certain feature. Time is not eternity. It's not going to last forever. It's finite. It has to come to an end. The animals in, in the desert are so sensitive to the seasons and the seasonal changes that they can know and anticipate when the rainy season is coming. They know that when it gets dark in the mountain, rain is coming. <laughs> is it dark in your mountain? Is it dark in your mountain? Rain will come. Just be patient. Become sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So you can know when your season of dryness is coming to an end. It's a season, people. It's a season. It's just for a time. Look up to the Most High God. And He will give you the signal that rain is coming. Just like Elijah on the mountain. Go and look. See if you see rain. No, I'm in a sin on. Pray, 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 pray. Send rain, God. Him. Call out to God. Him. Labor in prayer. Labor in prayer. You don't see a sign that rain is coming. That don't mean it's not coming. Labor in prayer. Labor until you see it. Listen. Do not be like mothers who have come to birth and don't have the strength to deliver. Because in Isaiah 66, God says he will not bring you to deliver and shut the womb. Okay? You just have to push. You just have to push. Listen, there is nothing that said, there is, I don't see anywhere in the word where it says we are going to have easy times. If anything, we've been promised persecution, hardship, judgment, ridicule. We've been promised all of that. I never see nothing that said my life going to be easy. But you know what I saw? I saw that God will be there with me through it all. I saw that he will take me through. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He is in, he knows my beginning. He knows my end. He has a plan for me to prosper me. That means no matter what the world throw at me, he will prosper me. No matter what, the, what anyone says, he will still prosper me. I just must walk in obedience to his word. And if I love him, obeying his word is not a hard thing. It's not. Some things may go against your grain, but if it's going against your grain, ask God to take it out because something in your way. Okay? I leave you with Isaiah 45, verse, sorry, Psalm 72, verse 6, verse. May he be like rain falling upon a moon field, like showers watering the earth. May the word of God be like that in your life. Like rain upon you. Bringing showers to water your earth. 
May the, the word of God be like that to you. Some, the only thing that can slake that thirst that you have has to be the word of God. Let me tell you something. Me love sweet drinks. Me love sweets. <laughs> Everybody know that. But you know, I recognize that with all the orange juice and, well, they say it's orange juice, but it's more like sugar and water. I find that I'm developing a, a distaste for sweet things. I'd rather drink water. And I, yeah, gotta work, man. Gotta work. I only got that. But I find that I would rather drink water. And my thirst is quenched. Listen, man. Then we put something sweet out there for you. Right? And we put something will look nice and orangey. And you would, it will be there beside the water, but that have color. And you go drink it, and you, the, the pleasures of sin only last for us. Okay? But when you drink deep of the water, every cell in your body jump for joy. Every cell plump up. You know, you, you can tell people who are drinking water regularly and people who are not drinking water. It shows even in the lips, the lips get cracked if you are not drinking enough water or they, they, they have wrinkles. But somebody who is constantly drinking water, you see even their complexion. You just see a cleanness to their features. It's the same thing with the word. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> they're 19, so they're 19. <laughs> um, somebody said to me the other day that I don't look like 50, I look like 35. This is the presence, are the presence. Come here, drink deep of the word. Come here, drink deep. You said, me can't read it. I turn it on and leave it playing the whole night. My spirit has soaked it up. Right? Anywhere me can get it in on me. Sometimes I find myself and quote some scripture and I say, God, where that come from again? <laughs> say, yeah, but it's my word. You've been soaking it up. And we, I mean, when Ron went through what he went through the other night, there were times when I was, I did get anxious, but it's not anxiety in terms of, um, not believing you be healed or so. It was just seeing someone I love in so much pain and being unable to help. And worse, he was being stubborn at the sick past on him. Right? <laughs> but <laughs> um, seeing him in so much pain, it, it, I felt uh, at one point I was saying, I, I, I don't know what to do and I can't handle no more. And I was really crying out, I was crying out. Physically and spiritually, I said, God help. But you know what I recognized about even that whole time, going to the hospital and while he was being treated and waiting on him to be admitted and so on. Pastor never wants to sign the consent for him, you know, me had to tell him I was going to stick him, stick him on him again. <laughs> and um, I just found myself automatically praying in the spirit. It, just, it was just an automatic thing. And I just started to calm down. The more I prayed in the spirit, the more I calmed down. And while I was waiting, well, when he got admitted, that the, I got lost in the hospital. <laughs> I was trying to find my way out. <laughs> and I ended up all over the place. Security stopped me several times. Where do you? At this time, I'm up. I said, boss, they just admit my husband. I'm trying to find my way out. And I don't have no proper signage, <laughs> you know? So anyway, he eventually took me to where the portals were. And I waited until morning because I couldn't get nobody to wake up. Everybody was fast asleep. And Uncle Odin came for me about six in the morning. But you know, I found myself singing two songs. Great are you, Lord. Well, the other one fly out of my head a while ago. But <laughs> I was just praising, that's the point I'm making. I was, I just, I realized that with all that was happening, it wasn't affecting my joy. The joy of the Lord is indeed my strength. Is it caring? Is it 
me, and trust me, I think these were two of the roughest days I've ever been through. I was so exhausted. Poor Simone can tell you, I was twitching and turning in class. I just wanted to go home. I was so exhausted. But still, my joy was untouched. Your pastor said, happiness is fleeting, but joy is eternal because joy is of God. You have something of God deep inside of you. No situation you're facing can touch it. People smile. Smile even yes. with what you're going through. Right. Unbelievers looking at us who know what we're going through must be able to say, no man, we want with them how? Because them still are smiling. Me know what them are going through. Me know what them are going through. So, I'm just going to leave one last verse with you, but I just want to encourage you. You know the song that says, smile when your heart is breaking. Really, even when your heart is breaking, you, you feel it a break, smile anyway, because God is going to heal whatever that is. Amen. God can heal Amen. any break, any crack. Amen. And if your heart is breaking, ask yourself, why? You know, and, and, and put it before the Lord. I, I can't I can't fathom doing anything in my life now without asking God, God, what am I to do with this? Sometimes I go home and I don't even know how to pray sometimes. Sometimes I can't even pray in the spirit. Some, some things are happening around me that it's just I'm being buffeted left, right and center. But I can still sing. I can still shout. I can still praise. I can say, God, you are God alone. God, yeah, you, yeah. you are just awesome, God. Because, you know, God, I am going through this. And I can still look at you and I can say, God, I'm smiling. Because I know you are in control. I know that nothing happened by accident. God, I know that you are in this somehow, God. Even if I can't see it, I know you are in it, God. And so when I step out of my house, I can step out with a smile. People look at me and say, oh, you do it. And they say, I know me. Pardon me, but me one, me give up. But if were it not for God, let me say, but God, but God. A lot of you right now are going through some stuff. Going through some stuff that you feel as if Storm winds just hitting your left, right, and center. But God, when he told his disciples that they were going over to the other side, they never said we were stopping at the sea, you know. He said we're going over to the other side. That is God's promise to you. So if he says he's going over, the question now is do you trust God to take you over no matter what you're seeing? The rain is coming. The rain is coming, and if you haven't seen the clouds yet, then your mountain is not dark enough. Because the dark clouds bring the rain. <laughs> I'll be here more if you go through. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but <laughs> you can still pray your way through it. Rain must come. Rain must come. And if you're not seeing the clouds, do like Elijah. Labor feet. Say, God, you promised me rain. Wait there. God, you promised me rain. You say it would be for this time. The time passed. What happened, God? What me fit do? What me not do? Ask. God will answer you, you know. God will answer you. And so, um, the scripture I'm leaving with you, Isaiah 45, verse 8. Open up all heavens and pour out your righteousness. Let the earth open wide so salvation and righteousness can sprout together. I, the Lord, created them. I would just like to take about five minutes for you to just do a little exercise. I would just like you to close your eyes and just don't think about anything. Don't think about anything at all. Just let God do. Let him do. 
no talking, no trying to pray in the spirit. Just let God do.